Hello and welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. This is a show about Haskell, a purely functional programming language. I'm your host, Taylor Fossack. I'm the Director of Software Engineering at ACI Learning. And with me today is Cameron Guerra, one of the engineers on my team. Thanks for joining me today, Cam. Thanks for having me today, Taylor. You know, it's uh, a beautiful sunny Friday at uh, in the Gainesville, Florida area, which is where we are located. Uh, and I think sure it's going to be a good day today. We've got uh, a fun article, um, but you know, I think we also have some drama in the Haskell sphere um, to something that I probably, or you know, I don't even think you, Taylor, use this platform very often. Uh, but Freenode, with you know, an IRC channel more or less, is going over some some changes and creating some drama. They are, yeah. Like you said, you know, neither of us are really IRC users, but the Haskell channel on Freenode is really popular. And there was some drama over the past week where the people who own Freenode kind of like changed hands or did something underhanded. And now everyone is leaving Freenode and moving over to this other place called, I want to say Libera or Libera. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, so if you are an IRC user and you're on Freenode and you're wondering where is the Haskell channel, somewhere else now. So, uh, some, uh, yeah, other people on the internet can probably do a better job of explaining it than us. We just know that it happened. Yeah, you know, we, we wanted to open it up for a little bit more banter. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's like, I have Slack, I have Discord, I'm on Reddit, I'm on Twitter. We use Teams at work. Like, I don't need another chat application. You don't want Keybase and Matrix <laughs> and Libra or Libra, or however you say that no. thing. And Zulip, there's, there's too many. There is. Well, you know, and we also, you know, on the podcast, we've interviewed someone who also has another social media platform, uh, mm -hmm. Chat Wisely. Chat Wisely. So, yeah. yeah. If you haven't heard that episode, check it out. Nice callback. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, I always like to reference back to the things we do. Yeah. The Haskell Weekly Cinematic Universe. Yeah. I mean, and speaking of, we're actually taking a flashback from last week to some degree because we have another post by Gabe Gonzalez, who we're going to talk about today. And it's he writes talking, good posts. Yeah, and I think Haskell Weekly has a, a love affair with him, which is okay. <laughs> now, I think you know he, he does put out regularly good posts, uh, which is nice to have for a site like Haskell Weekly, so we can you know, inform everyone and all of our listeners of uh, some, some cool stuff going on. So he kind of uh, does three big ideas in this uh, article, and this article is called Module Organization Guidelines for Haskell Projects. And like I said, there's three kind of big ideas that he kind of unwraps here. So we're going to just kind of jump right in. Uh, and this is something I think the first topic is one that honestly, internally, IT Pro TV and ACI Learning, we're, we're divided on as far as our code base is concerned. <laughs> because, you know, when you have a web application with an API, you know, you tend to make a horizontal, you know, organization um, but here he talks yeah. about organizing modules vertically not horizontally uh, so for us if we were going to be creating libraries constantly and third-party you know sdks more or less for other clients and yeah vertically would make sense um, but for an api that has the same underlying types sometimes it's hard to do that yeah. And it may be kind of hard to conceptualize what is meant by vertically and horizontally. I like to visualize it or think about it in terms of like vertical integration for a company where it's like, oh, we manage, you know, from farm to table or from widget to device or whatever it is. Uh, so it's like all of the stuff that you need to get one thing done is all together in one slice. That is to me vertical versus horizontal is you're going to split things up based on what they are rather than what they do. So it's like, okay, we're going to have all the types over here and we're going to have all the type classes over here. Um, and I feel like for me, I tend toward the horizontal thing where I'm like, oh, well, this is a type. I'll put it over here with all the other types. Uh, but at a certain size, that kind of falls apart. And as you touched on in our code base, we have both. So... <laughs> Ta -da. We're, we're diagonal. Yeah, well, I, I think your uh, your analogy there, or explanation of it, uh, reminded me of something related more to farms, which is like a silo. You know, there's a silo like vertically that holds, I think, something. I don't really actually know. All the grain. Yeah. All grain. Uh, you know, and then there's like the, the troughs that 
the horse to eat out of. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I prefer to be a horse than a piece of grain because I'm, I'm <laughs> can't eat gluten, so I don't want to always be irritated. So I'm going to mm -hmm. go with the trough style. Yeah, there you go. Trough versus silo. Yep. So if you're a farmer, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> let us know how wrong we got it. Um, and the example he gives is, uh, you know, dealing with like parsing and evaluating and type checking. So that makes sense because he's working on a language doll. So he naturally has all of these things that he's working on. But like you mentioned for our application, um, we're integrating with a bunch of third parties and we're also developing our own in-house stuff. So we end up with a little bit of both where it's like, oh, we're talking to intercom for our customer, you know, engagement platform. So all the intercom stuff goes over there, but we have all of our like HTTP handlers in one namespace. So, so the handler part is horizontal, but the intercom part is vertical. And I think it's, you know, in general, I agree with him. You should probably prefer verticality, but, um, you can make good use of both. Yeah. And I feel like we've even kind of evolved through time with this, um, because yes, we were kind of vertically to some degree with our initial, um, HTTP server that we created um, using Hapstack, we kind of kept the types and everything kind of siloed within um, mm -hmm. the the structure. And then we realized, okay, well now we have multiple HTTP servers that need to share these types, and you know we don't want to repeat them everywhere. Uh, but you know we still have, like you said, like an intercom integration. It makes more sense to push everything over. Uh, and yeah. I'm actually dealing with that right now with uh, Practice Labs because I want to extract a lot of the stuff into its own kind of vertical rather than it being in the trough with everything else because um, mm -hmm. it's it's hard to parse when it's in the middle of you know an, a database model versus you know a third-party response right so it would be nice to clean that up but i was looking at yeah. his kind of like module structure that he was talking about and i was like wow yep we're probably more horizontal than we are vertical because we have <laughs> a types module we have not necessarily a lib module but a that's where our our source file is a lib file, more or yeah. less. Um, and and uh, with regards to the types module, we do have one of those, but we're moving away from it, re-exporting all of the types that are underneath it, which is one of the points he gives against this horizontal layout is that uh, if you have like, you know, types dot star, and then in other places that aren't types, you're gonna wanna import all of that all together because it's convenient. But when what ends up happening is if you change one type everything has to get rebuilt because everything depends on all of the types. And what we've moved toward instead is having more granular imports. So we'll put like each type in its own module and then import only the types we need. So that can get a little tedious when you're writing it, but then when you have to rebuild only the stuff that actually is affected by the changes you made gets rebuilt, which is nice. Yeah. We were experiencing that tension of longer build times because yeah, you know, well, not necessarily longer build times, but longer rebuild times because one yeah. thing at the bottom would get changed and then everything, you know, the rest of the tree would have to recompile. And mm -hmm. that was just painful, painful and just frustrating. She's like, ah, I need now why? So <laughs> thankfully yeah. we're, we're growing like many engineers do. Um, you know, so that's good. And engineering yeah, departments. It's... It's like we always say, you know, if you if you look back at the code you wrote a year ago and you still think it looks good, you probably haven't grown much in the meantime. <laughs> what? I'm like an apple tree that hasn't produced any fruit. Yeah. Um, but I also wanted to touch on one other thing he mentions here as motivation for prefer preferring the vertical orientation. And it's something you touched on as well, Cam, of if there are pieces of your application or your or whatever you're working on that could be pulled out as separate packages. Those things are, are probably a vertical slice where it's like, it does everything it needs to. And, you know, it's like, okay, it's going to talk to intercom or it's going to talk to whatever third party or whatever, you know, library or driver. Um, and that is a compelling way to architect your application because then you can become sort of like a, you're just the glue between all of these little packages that you've built which is a nice way to maintain stuff. Right, yeah, and it creates that nice interface. I think you and I were actually talking about that off air before we, we started, just how much nicer, like, if you have just a good interface from a package-like experience, you can really work that into your application in a clear and readable way, and that mm -hmm. doesn't 
you know, muck it up with third party information that doesn't really matter to the business logic that you have in place. Exactly. That vertical slice forces you to think about what your, what interface are you exposing versus with the types, the horizontal slice, you just say like, well, here's a bag of types. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in our like vert or when we were doing the you know, overall big types re-export thing, you know, that file that holds all the re-exports is still just as like super long and hard to really find unless you're just mm -hmm. doing a project wide search, like going through that file is like, oh, wow, there's a lot here. So it's yeah. generally a little easier to like, at least now we can just do fuzzy find on all this stuff without getting that file in the way mm -hmm. more or less. Yeah. It, it's interesting that the vertical slice also encourages you to use better tools. And in the, like for us, you know, we would love to use HLS, but that's even, um, you know, like we, we don't need to tab nine gets the same thing. Fuzzy find does the same thing. So like these general purpose tools that are built for anything can be leveraged to make writing vertically sliced Haskell code a lot nicer. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Well, I think that's everything I had to say about vertical versus horizontal. Um, you got anything else you want to move on to the next one? No, I, I say let's, let's go on to naming conventions. Yeah. So naming conventions are up next and, uh, this maybe is less relevant, I think to most people, because I feel like most Haskell developers probably aren't publishing packages. Like we've, we've published a handful. Um, and I personally have published a few, but I feel like most people just use existing packages. Hopefully that's not too, uh, too crazy of an idea. <laughs> <laughs> what? Every Haskell developer doesn't create their own packages. I would love it if everyone did. If you're listening to this, please, you know, publish a package to hackage, feel out what that whole process looks like. Um, it's fun and rewarding and you'll get a, a little more appreciation for what it takes to put together a good package. Right. Well, and it seems I, I would completely agree with, uh, Gabe's kind of position here on, you know, when you're, you have a package, you know, name, you know, keep the package name as close to the like module name, module name as possible. That way it's easier to, you know, understand, oh, I'm importing, you know, foobar baz and I can access it at foobar baz. Um, yeah. So the, the one exception to this, or, or not the one exception to like the, the strange difference here is that hackage package names are typically lower cased and connected with hyphens, which I often call kebab case because it's like, you know, a kebab. Um, and then Haskell package names are capitalized and camel cased and separated with dots. So you can't have dots in package names. So it would make sense to replace those with hyphens. But um, I mentioned this because like a package like um, quick check, you know, the actual package name has a capital Q and a capital C, which is a little strange as far as packages go, but it is closer to the module name. Although in this case, the module name is test dot quick check. So those don't even match. So it's kind of the worst of both worlds, but <laughs> so this is why Gabe wrote the article. Exactly. Um, I, I could, I could see the rationale for having a package named quick check with capital Q and C and it exposing a module called quick check with capital Q and C cause then they would match. Right. But for whatever reason, the community has decided no package names are lowercase and hyphenated, even though module names are camel case. Good old kebab case. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've become, you know, as probably a newer person to Haskell than you, like I've come to understand the, the reasoning for that, well, not necessarily understand it, but accept it like, mm -hmm. oh, okay. Like 90% of the time, the package name is going to be a hyphenated version of the, the main module generally, right. like seems to be the practice. And I'm glad that Gabe kind of brought this up for the community to kind of just see and remind themselves that, Hey, it's probably a better idea to keep this clear because first of all, you have a lot, you know, if you're not the only user of this package, you're gonna have people who are like confused or frustrated because it's just slightly different than what it should be. Um, yeah. or, you know, it is a really long module name, which we have really long module names because we have fairly <laughs> nested, Lots of nested data. Um, but yeah, there, there's no reason to make the primary interface for your package, a really long module name. 
and the example he gives is a perfect one for the pretty printer package used to the entry point used to be data dot text dot pretty print dot doc and like really you want to make everybody that uses your package import that mouthful why not just import pretty printer which is what they switched to yep but that one's not camel cased so i'm very yeah that, that's a weird one <laughs> uh yeah and then you know it seems to also help with naming clashes between packages mm -hmm. right because if or the package name has to be unique. There's no way you can get around that. So if you name your module after your package, it's probably going to be unique because somebody would have to be a jerk to write. You know, like if I wrote a package called, uh, you know, Taylor's Pretty Printer, and I exposed a top-level module called Pretty Printer, that would just be a jerk move on my part. So, right. you know. <laughs> Gosh, such a jerk, Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I think that's about I have all I have to say on naming conventions. Naming conventions. Is there anything else you have to add? That's it for me too. Um, I, I agree with Gabe as per usual. Maybe that's why we talk about his posts so much on here. I just agree with everything he says. Well, Gabe, <laughs> if you're listening, you know, reach out. We can get you on the podcast. Yeah, we'd love to sit down for an interview. Yeah, maybe next the next time we record a podcast, since we're already on two in a row, just. just do the trifecta <laughs> with an interview with you at the end. So Yeah, he's going to slowly take over the whole podcast. It'll be the Gabe show. <laughs> and then we'll just be sending out the Gabe Weekly newsletter. Mm -hmm. Yep, you got it. Nice. Um, all right, so what's, what's the next thing we're going to talk about, Taylor? So the last one is, I think, maybe the, the weirdest one and one I hadn't thought about before. He calls it the God Library Stanza. And he prefaces this with a caveat that it's only for proprietary projects, so stuff that you're not intending to publish on the hackage or wherever. Um, but the idea is that instead of splitting up your package into the normal parts where you have a library and an executable and a test suite and benchmarks, instead you throw everything into the library and then for all those other bits, all that you do is point to a particular part. So like for your executable, all you do is say, Hey, import, you know, my library dot executable and do that. And same thing for test suite, import my library dot test suite and do that. Um, we actually do this for our executable. And I, I encourage everyone to do that of like, if you're going to write some type of CLI that you want to upload to hackage, put all of the actual business logic in a library. And that way, if people want to use it in other Haskell programs, they can. And the perfect example of this is HLint. They expose, or they, Neil exposes the entire um, API as, you know, just a regular module that you can use. So if you want to use it on the command line, you can do that. If you want to use it in your library, you can do that too. Um, but what Gabe is suggesting here is even more extreme, right? He wants you to put your entire test suite into your library. And that's crazy, right, Kim? Like, why would you do that? <laughs> well, I mean, why not at this point? I mean, he's... He... He says, you know, don't do it for open source projects, but if you have a proprietary project you're not putting out there, like it seems to be a better move. Um, and um, sorry, I'm just trying to catch up a little no, bit more on it. You're good. So, so I think the main benefit he poses here is that for the Cabal command line tool, um, if you want to bring up a REPL for your project, Cabal can't load your library and your executable or your test suite or whatever else at the same time. It can only pick one component to do at a time. So if you want to like run your test suite in the REPL because you're editing it and you want to, you know, get some quick feedback, you can do that. But as soon as you make a change to your library and you go and reload your test suite, it's not going to pick that change up. You have to close the whole REPL and start it up again, which is a huge pain in the butt. Right, right. So, yeah, which, I mean, that that would keep the REPL development faster mm -hmm. overall. Yeah, and, and I'm saying REPL, but this applies to, like, GHCID as well, because that's just a REPL under the hood. Under the hood. Yeah. Um, and I mentioned that for us, we have our executable implemented like this already, but we don't do this for our test suite. 
And I think one of the reasons why is that we use Stack as our build tool and Stack actually can load up the REPL with your library and your test suite at the same time. So we haven't run into this particular limitation. Right. But if you're using Cabal, it would be worth a shot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it'll also give you quicker recompiles on your test suite. So normally, if you changed anything in your library at all, your test suite naturally depends on your library. So the whole thing has to get rebuilt because that entire component has changed. So it assumes everything is busted. But if you have, you know, file A and file A has a test associated with it and same for B, then if you changed A, B and B's test won't need to be rebuilt. So that feedback loop will be quicker. Mm. Nice. Yeah, seems, seems like a useful thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, I, I am excited to uh, try it out. I've never set up any of my projects like that with the test suite like mixed in with the regular code. So I want to try that out and see how it goes. Yeah, maybe we can uh, throw it into ours since our test suite always seems to get be getting recompiled. And as we add more <laughs> yeah. tests, it's more uh, tedious, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, tedious driven development, tedium driven <laughs> development. <laughs> yep. Perfect, that's the new TDD. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and uh, like our test suite frequently doesn't, like it's got a hundred or 200 modules in the test suite. And usually you haven't touched any source files that would cause the test suite to get rebuilt, but the whole thing gets rebuilt anyway. So that's a bit annoying. Mm -hmm. It'd be nice to avoid that. Yeah, could be a quality of life improvement for us here at ACL. Mm -hmm. Sure could. All right. So well, uh, sure, we've reached the end here of yet another wonderful Gabe Gonzalez article. Yeah, well, you know, I was just going to ask you as my shirt twin, you know, which, which of these three was your, was your favorite? Ooh, I think my favorite is the, the vertical versus horizontal. And, uh, I just feel like it, it's such a good way to think about architecting your application, even though we don't, you know, like rigidly adhere to it all the time. I think that any given vertical slice is probably going to be more useful than the the corresponding horizontal slice. So like if you just give me, here's all the intercom stuff to keep using that one as an example, I'll be able to look at that and figure out what's going on versus if you say, here's all of our types. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Right. Yeah. It gives you a little bit more clarity of what should be happening here. Mm -hmm. So the intercom oh. slice deals and talks to intercom. To return exactly. Data. Which one's your fave, Cam? Uh, I would also say vertical versus horizontal. I think it's something that we've kind of wrestled with in the past, just of like figuring out sometimes we, we, we kind of have pushes towards, all right, let's silo stuff. And then mm -hmm. there's times where we're like, okay, yeah, let's put it in a more general spot that more things can use. And I, I just think for us, it depends on what that is. You know, is it a new API integration with a third party? Is it you know, a new way of importing and exporting types? Is it, you know, a new way of querying the database? Like what's, you know, so I think for us, it just depends on, mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes it's almost like their, their own vertical, like, oh, this type is a vertical, but it's not because it's used across multiple, you know, it's like a yeah. silo with a bunch of tubes going to other places, you know, <laughs> which is like, I don't think that's how it's We're really to stretching the metaphor here. I, you know, I'm doing what I can here, you know. <laughs> but no, I think, uh, yeah, I think that would be, be mine, uh, as well. Cool. Yeah. And, and again, just to really underscore this, like, um, by designing those vertical slices, we, in the course of development, we have asked ourselves, what would this look like if we turned it into a separate library? And we don't always follow through on that. You know, we don't always end up publishing another library as a result of that, but it's still useful to go through those steps. And sometimes we do end up publishing a library and then, you know, it's actually useful. It's not just a bag of types or, or whatever else. It's like, oh, you can use this to talk to, we haven't published an intercom library, but you can use this to talk to um, Sentry or Recurly or something like that. So, so you're saying WWLD, what LD? would a library do? Oh yeah. There you go. I was thinking WWGGD, what would Gabe Gonzalez do? <laughs> ah, that's also a good one. Uh, so look out for on the Ask a Weekly website for t-shirts with WWGGD and WWLD. So those there should be coming to a Haskell Weekly near you soon. <laughs> 
All right, well, that's all I've got. You got anything else, Cam? No, I think that's about it. Cool. Well, that will do us do it for us this week. Uh, thank you so much for listening to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. I have been your host, Taylor Fossack, and with me today was Cameron Guerra. If you want to find out more about us, everything you want to know is at our website, and our website is haskellweekly.news. I just realized that I didn't say my name once. I don't have to introduce myself. This is nice. Uh, but anyways, Haskell Weekly is brought to you uh, by IT Pro TV, an ACI learning company, also our employer. They would like to offer you 30% off the lifetime of your subscription at ITPro.TV by using the promo code Haskell Weekly 30 at checkout. And if you're not interested in paying for a membership, we also offer a free one that will get you access to some great content. Uh, but I think that does it about blah, 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 blah. <laughs> wow, I, I can't I can't talk today, but that's okay. Uh, I think that about does it for us. Thank you for joining us on the Haskell Weekly Podcast, and we'll see you next week. Bye. <laughs>